Well, to discuss the pros and cons of universal basic income, we're joined by John Tammy, Tammy editor for both Real Clear Market and Forbes magazine, and Matt Brunig, a contributor at Demos, a progressive think tank. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So, Matt, let's, let's start with you. Just how feasible is it to build an economy on UBI? Well, I don't know that building an economy is the right way to look at it. It would be a benefit program, just like Social Security or food stamps or supplemental security income. These are systems that already exist in our economy, and they help supplement uh, incomes that you receive from working or from investments. So it would just be an additional program on top of those. And do you think, is this something that we actually need? Uh, no, it's, it's the exact opposite. But you can't build an economy by paying people whether they work or not. Furthermore, imagine the political football this will be when politicians can basically compete with each other to see who can offer the most to the citizenry, where ci the citizens can actually vote themselves raises on the backs of their fellow men. It's, it's immoral, but it would also cause a lot of societal instability. And what's your take on that? I don't see how it would cause instability. Like I said, we have programs like this. Social Security provides an old age pension to tens of millions of people, as well as a disability pension to tens of millions of people. Those programs are also able to be adjusted through politics, through benefit increases or benefit cuts. So it would be yet another program that would be thrown into the system of social benefits we have. And we don't, those aren't particularly problematic. But there's a big difference. With those, you are paying into those programs. With this, you are guaranteed whether you work or not. Huge, huge difference in terms of the societal impact and the ability of people to vote themselves raises no matter what they do. Now, we are seeing this used in some countries. What do you think are some examples of UBI when it's done well, and how is that working out? So Alaska actually has a universal basic income program. Over the past few decades, they built a $61 billion social wealth fund. And that fund is invested in stocks and bonds, and it generates an investment return. And that investment return is then parceled out evenly to everyone in Alaskan society. And so in a given year, they, it might be as high as $3,000 a year per person. So for a family of four, that's 12000 And that's been around for decades, and it's been very successful. And what would you say are some of the biggest weaknesses, though, that come with UBI? Well, I think, first of all, one of the good things about this is that if we're going to have something that I consider awful, it should be on the state level. People should be able to choose whether they want something like this. So I like the idea of if Alaska wants to do something ridiculous, it should do it. But the weaknesses are that, again, you are paid whether you work or not. You're, we're basically rewarding indolence, all the while penalizing enterprise. And I, but the biggest weakness is that we're setting society against each other. Those who work the most will be fleeced, and people will be able to vote themselves more of the income of the productive at the expense of the unproductive. How do you grow an economy? How do you grow a good society based on that? I don't, I don't get it. Well, we're certainly seeing that some Silicon Valley leaders, including your Mark Zuckerberg, your Elon Musk, are really saying this is actually a way to reduce poverty, and not only that, a way to counteract some of the job losses that we might see from automation. What's your take on that assessment? Yes, so the automation link, I think, is very important and, and somewhat ties into the point he's been making about people who produce and people who don't produce. So in our, in our economy as it exists right now, about 30% of the income is paid to capital, people who own assets. They're paid for, they're, they get money not because they work for it, but because of what they happen to own. If automation really t takes off, that 30%, which currently is paid passively to people, could go up to 35, 40, et cetera. So it starts to become a bigger problem if more and more of the national income is paid out to people who simply own the robots or land or factories or what have you. So does that seem like such a bad strategy then to offset some of the losses that we'll see in automation? Well, let's first of all be clear. If the U.S. had a poverty problem, it wouldn't be a magnet for the world's poor for decades and decades and centuries. We are where poverty is cured, as evidenced by the fact that the world's poorest risk their lives to get here. So I reject the notion that we have a poverty problem. But the second thing, if automation kills jobs, 
why is the most automated country in the world, the U.S., the richest, most employed country in the world? The reality is robots and automation will be the biggest job creators ever. If you want to see where people are poor and living hand to mouth, look at the countries that lack the, quote, robots. Everything from a tractor to a computer to an ATM machine, those are all robots. If we want to create jobs, let's just abolish the computer and car and airplane tomorrow. We'll have lots of jobs. We'll be incredibly poor. But there will be lots of jobs. I mean, but in reality, though, you, you cannot say that there's no poverty in this country. Clearly, there is. There are a lot of people living below the poverty line. Ha, ha, what's your response to this? Yeah, the United States, among developed countries, has some of the highest levels of poverty, uh, especially child poverty, where our, our child poverty rate tends to float around 20 percent, whereas countries like Denmark, it might be 4 percent. So we do have an issue where our income is distributed very unevenly, and those at the bottom tend to get a very small amount. So it is an issue. And, and, and to, to, to respond to his point about um, automation, automation is good. Capital investment is good. Having more machines and stuff that makes us more productive is good. The issue that you run into is how do you distribute the gains of that productivity growth? And if employment or the welfare state isn't able to spread those gains out in an equitable way, you're going to get more and more inequality. And just quickly, I want to look at one of the ways that this is perhaps being funded might be off of more taxes for companies. What does that do then for the attractiveness of the U.S. as a place to come and do business and, and create businesses? What's well, your take well, on that? Well, it would logically make it less attractive. If we're going to penalize achievement, we're not going to attract the, the achievers as, as much. And I just, I'm hearing about dist distribution of income and somehow the planning of it. We tried that around the world in the 20th century, and it failed in bloody fashion. A death toll of roughly 100 million. I don't think we should try that again, whereby the people at the commanding heights decide who earns what. We are the we attract the world's talented and strivers and the poor precisely because we don't plan who earns what. Well, there's certainly so much to discuss. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. John Tamney, editor at Real Clear Markets and Forbes Magazine, and Matt Brunick, contributor at Demos. Thank you, gentlemen.